countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, one, fire. Lords and ladies, geeks, geekerellas, geekulas, and geekeritas. I am Lord Bloodraw, and this is Lord Bloodraw's Nerve Rack and Theater. And tonight's movie addresses a classic science fiction question. What if, when we become old and infirmed, we could switch bodies with someone younger and healthier? That's a classic science fiction premise, and a terrifying one, too. And one addressed here by one of the weirdest movies we've ever presented. Ha <laughs> ha! Tonight, from 1963, it's the quickie sci-fi horror schlocker, The Atomic Brain. Ha <laughs> ha! And, my lords and ladies, it literally is a quickie. So, after the conclusion of The Atomic Brain, we'll have a very special surprise for you. As always. Ha <laughs> ha! But now, without further ado, I give to you an old woman, a mad scientist, three young ladies, and a bizarre brain shuffle. Ha <laughs> ha! Here is the Atomic Brain. Can death be outwitted? Is the secret of eternal life just around that corner? Today, medical science patches up mutilated bodies, transplanting human skin, eyes, limbs, even vital organs. Is the next step the transplantation of the human brain? Many scientists answer yes, but they pause and add a grim warning. For in the ancient folk legends, tales are told of blood-sucking vampires, crawling out of graves to live on the bodies of helpless victims. Is man now doomed to produce a race of ever-living monstrosities? Worse than the vampires of legend. Will ruthless men and women of great wealth and power greedily buy or steal the living bodies of the young and beautiful so their brains may live on forever? Such questions may seem fanciful, but at this very moment, scientists are working on the answer to brain transplantation, and human bodies are used. This girl was buried in a nearby cemetery yesterday. Only a few hours ago, her body was stolen by Dr. Otto Frank and brought to this hidden laboratory. He has grafted a living animal's brain into this newly dead body. If the experiment works, the next step will be the transplantation of a human brain. The brain cells are being reactivated by an atomic fission produced in the cyclotron. found the way to outwit death, or has he created another?
Deep below, Dr. Frank takes the chance of smashing his way into a newly sealed vault. His experiments cannot continue without another body. mistakes, a monstrosity, an animal's brain grafted to a human body. Leaving the dead watchman, the monstrosity carried the girl's body out of the vault. It fears and obeys one master, Dr. Frank. Beneath the old mansion, the doctor carefully prepared for another transplant. This body had been in the vault for only a few hours. Chances seemed better this time. Still, Dr. Frank was doubtful. Tissue in dead bodies deteriorates rapidly. Where were the live, fresh bodies he'd been promised? He bitterly resents that every step forward depends on the whim of a miserly old woman brooding upstairs in her bedroom. And Hetty March wonders. Has she been a fool, squandering money on this strange experiment? Money hoarded through a long, greedy lifetime, each day more money, each day death getting closer. Ah, but to start life again in a brand new body, beautiful and young, no price can be too high for that. Can she really trust the doctor? Can she really trust anyone? Hasn't everyone tried to cheat her? Wanting her money while they smiled at her ugliness? But they never got a penny. Oh, how she made them sweat. Especially this old fool companion and gigolo. How many years she's kept him dangling on promises. Well, sometimes it's convenient to have a man, especially when he comes cheaper than servants. That's the Austrian girl? Nino Rose, 18, no family, pleasing personality, whatever that might mean. Hmm? Thick ankles, pimply face, but she always smiles when she's spoken to, very likely. Well, application forms for a servant girl don't usually include bust, waist, and hip measurements. Mm -hmm. All three will be here tomorrow, and then you can choose. At Greenhaven Cemetery, the body snatchers brutally murdered night watchman Robert Payne, 62, who evidently interrupted his killers during their ghoulish task. His neck was broken. The imprint of a huge pair of hands was found on his throat. It's the opinion of the police that the same gang that has previously... Ring for Dr. Frank. So that's what he was doing. Voiceovers. So many voiceovers. That doesn't bode well. Remember the Beast of Yucca Flats? All voiceovers. Very little movie. Have I been a fool choosing to show this movie? Is this the movie that finally makes the viewers say, No, enough. Why are you showing me this? I'd rather watch the Real Housewives of Paducah, Kansas. Only time will tell. And these commercials aren't helping anything either.
Do you love horror, science fiction, B-movies, horror hosts, old-time radio, just plain spooky stuff? Then you should sign up at patreon.com slash lordbloodraw. You'll be supporting the production of Lord Blood Draw's Nerve Rack and Theater, presenting the best, worst, and wildest horror films ever made. Lord Blood Draw's Nerve Rack and Auditorium, featuring the best of old-time radio horror. Captain Paxar's Star Cadet Hour, showing classic 1950s sci-fi shows for Star Cadets of all ages. Plus, you'll get exclusive access to bonus content, like Behind the Curtains of the Nerve Rack and Auditorium, a deep dive into radio horror. Lord Blood Draw's B-Movie Reviews, a look at a classic low-budget drive-in feature, and much more. Sign up today at patreon.com slash lordbloodraw for the love of horror. X-ray, ultra, violet, and alpha, beta, and omega rays. This man is a killer. Oh. Mad with dreams of fantastic power. We're conducting experiments requiring fissionable materials. That's atom bomb stuff. The government has that locked up tighter than Fort Knox. You work for us faithfully, or you'll be turned over to the authorities. I understand there's a reward of $5,000 on your head. No money is safe. No man is safe. Nothing stops the amazing transparent man. Into army-guarded secret government vaults he goes, stealing confidential nuclear material, holding in his unseen hands the key to world power. But the amazing transparent man wants first vengeance. If I choke you hard enough, you'll bring me back. Now back to the atomic brain and a big steaming dose of mad science and laboratory noises. The doctor transplanted a brain from a live dog to a dead human body. You saw the creature walk out of that cylinder alive. How many failures since then? Still, it's your money. The body must be fresh. This specimen is excellent. And the police are looking for the body statue. Why the local cemetery, Doctor? Are you trying to blaze a trail to our door? The final test was essential for your protection. As for the police, if they come here, I hit the switch. A nuclear reaction is set off. Close the circuit breaker. Uh. And in a matter of minutes, this house and any evidence it might contain becomes a radioactive hole in the ground. Be careful. But we can wait for that until after your operation. Well, nothing must go wrong. There's no sign of life. Watch.
thing. The brain. Hans was still living when he was dragged from that wrecked car. That's why we succeeded with the transplant. She seems alive. She is, to a limited extent. She'll be able to move around, but the brain deterioration is too extensive for thought processes. Ten miles. Which way? That way. Are you going to Hollywood? No such luck. I'm what's known as born domestic. For the next 12 months, I'll be scrubbing floors and making beds. But when my time's up, Hollywood will look out. That's strange. A foreign domestic agency paid my passage, too. I'm from Vienna, Austria. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I'm from England. No. Is this your first trip? Yes. I'm awfully excited. <laughs> Poor Spurboard. I know speak in place very good. Are you going to work for Mrs. March, too? This sounds like a sister act. You, too? Nina Rose? Yes, sir. Anita Gon Gonzalez? Beatrice Mullins, eh? That's right. Are you Mr. March? No, I work for Mrs. March. Come along. Three new bodies, fresh, live, young bodies. No families or friends within thousands of miles, no one to ask embarrassing questions when they disappear. <laughs> You wondered which one Mrs. March would pick. The little Mexican, the girl from Vienna, or the buxom blonde. Victor knew his pick, but he still felt uneasy. Making love to an 80-year-old woman in the body of a 20-year-old girl is insanity. Still, Hetty's plan to transfer her fortune to the new body had been brilliant. Unpleasant to think of what was going to happen to these girls, but a man has to consider his own future. What would happen to him if Hetty were to cast him off after all these years? Warm welcome to hang out. Well, there's your new home, girls. <sighs> Gives me the shivers. Aren't there any neighbors? No. Are there any other servants? No, but I don't think you're going to find it boring.
What a jolly little place this is. to leave this house without permission. Now, hurry along. Hurry up. Now, go. Turn round, slowly. Get the doctor. Get the doctor. As with the other bodies stolen from cemeteries, the nerve endings of the brain were too far gone to receive a proper transplant. The experiment had failed to produce anything more than a walking, breathing, zombie-like creature. But the doctor permitted her to wander about the laboratory. She was quite harmless and, at times, even amusing. Charming, isn't she? Did you want something? Uh, Mrs. March is waiting for you. The girls have arrived. Welcome to hang out. Gives me the shivers. Aren't there any neighbors? No. Are there any other servants? No, but I don't think you're going to find it boring. What was that? No one's to leave this house without permission. Now, hurry along. Hurry up. Now go. You know, my lords and ladies, once again, I find myself asking myself, is this a good idea? Is it a good idea for these young ladies to stay in that house after seeing the keep out signs and hearing that there are no neighbors and that one girl seeing that guy at the window with the really bad underbite? I say no, but if they don't stay in the house then we don't have a movie. And in this case, that might not be the worst thing. We'll be right back. Instructions are to prepare for an attack by an unknown enemy. That's what he meant. Something behind this, something we don't understand. The weapon he uses, it's unheard of. Blasting flesh right off the bones. Master control to fleet, set flight pattern to minus point zero eight. Increase speed. They're coming right at us! Get down inside the cave!
I want them examined immediately. Very well. This way. Victor, the doctor can conduct the examination perfectly. <laughs> what an old spoiled spot I am. <laughs> Have you disconnected the phone? Can't I depend on you for anything? Won't it be nice when those girls start calling police, employment agencies, immigration authorities, consulates? There will be no phone calls. Hideous. She's useless. There is one more test I should make. Do anything you want with her. The other two? Perfect medical specimens. All right, Anita. Get dressed now and wait for the others. Mrs. March, I am now giving you notice. I do not care to work in this house any longer. I demand that... You have signed an agreement. If you have any objection, you will discuss them with the immigration authorities as provided for in your papers. But, Mrs. March... Later. Stand up, my dear. I've got the same measurements as Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> <clears throat> the lucky girl? Yeah. Allow me to be the first to offer congratulations. <laughs> to both of you. <laughs> For me? Come on. Come on. Your room is in the basement, Anita. Nina, your room is upstairs, right across from the top of the stairs. I'll have to show you. Nonsense. You'll be all right. Go on. left a little while ago. Maybe she went with him. She didn't get out of this prison without permission, that's for sure. Yes. But she would have said goodbye. 
Why should she? We only met her yesterday. I don't blame her for not wanting to sleep in the basement. Oh. It's funny, though. Mrs. March wouldn't even listen when I asked to be dismissed. This house gives me the creeps. She doesn't even have any uniforms for us. Be what in the world do you think you're doing? He told us last night to clean and polish in here. Look at your hands. That will leave a stain on them. Now, now don't argue. Go in and wash them immediately. You can put the things away after Nina cleans them. Mrs. March, where is Anita? Anita? Oh. She left. Last night. I would like to give notice too. I will discuss it with you. Another time. Nina! Nina! Come here this instant! Yes, Mrs. March? Your name is it Nina. But Mrs. March, she's got polish all over hands, and I'm not doing anything. I don't want you running up and down stairs. Those pretty legs of yours will get ugly muscles. Send Nina to me. Yes, ma'am. I'll be in my room. Be come with me. I want to show you something. Anita wouldn't leave without taking her clothes. I think we'd better get out of here fast. B, I'd hate to go if she's still here. You go now if you go with me. Last experiment before Dr. Frank would be ready. But this was the most critical of all the experiments. For the first time, the grafting operation would be performed on a living human body. And the brain would come from the doctor's favorite cat. Anita was ready. You know, I'm usually against abducting people and performing brain surgery on them against their will. I just find it rude. But in this case, it might help them with their accents. I'm from Vienna, Austria. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I'm from England. No. Is this your first trip? Yes. I'm awfully excited. <laughs> Poor little boy. I know speak English very good. Wow. Old Time Radio. Horror. Experience the subtle magic of old-time radio horror every week with Lord Bloodraw's Nerve Rackin' Auditorium. Chilling audio nightmares from radio classics like Lights Out, The Witch's Tale, Dark Fantasy, and many more. Available on YouTube and most podcast providers. Lord Bloodraw's Nerve Rackin' Auditorium. Please leave your eyes at the door. You will not need them. Spider Island. Oh, 
Eight beautiful girls and one lone man struggling for survival. With death, sudden, violent, and horrible lurking in the shadows. Horrors of Spider Island. Out of the night came a fate worse than death. A man's mind twisted, his brain poisoned with an uncontrollable lust to kill. Horrors of Spider Island. A tale of terror that will leave you limp. So hideous and shocking, you won't believe your eyes. His hunger for victims was never satisfied. Prepare to be frightened out of your wits by the horrors of Spider Island. It's me, Nina. What about your clothes? Never mind, let's go. I'm here, Mrs. March. She's locked us in. Open it. I said open it. Mrs. March.
You failed. She thinks she's a cat. Nice to be. the way Mrs. Marsh treats you. I can't say that I blame you. Kitty's always been very fond of me, haven't you? Does she have all the instincts of a cat? Watch. that, Anita? Where? Oh, I don't think so. about to leave this house after what they've witnessed. They know Hans is outside there. Even if we could get past that creature outside, there's still the electric fence. The phone's dead. Can't get help that way. If we could get the car, He likes me, I guess. If you could get the keys from him. B. I was having a little nightcap. Who do you think you are pinching me? What? What? Maybe you like some company. Someone like me? Victor? Wait. Huh? 
Hans is chained. Let's go outside. Outside? I think I'd like that. into the ocean. It looks exactly like the South American Fantigua fish. I hope you can take one alive, Sheriff. I still believe that a human clawed that girl to death. The Beach Girls and the Monster. Starring John Hall, Sue Casey, and the glamorous Watusi dancing girls from Hollywood's famed Whiskey A Go Go nightclub. Music by Frank Sinatra, Jr. You got a monster in the turf. Chicks, do you have a problem? You won't have after you meet the monster on the beach. If you see this ghoul, play it cool. Beauties in bikinis, laughing, singing, surfing, sinning. Beach party lovers making hey hey in the moonlight while the monster waits and watches. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This one will kill you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Anita, let me help you. complex, isn't it? The human eye. She's unconscious, but she'll live. No. She will live. How I need her all. She's dead. Nina, dear, come along with us now. You've had a bad shock. Get out of here, both of you. The same would be. Why don't you do something for her? I've done what I can for now. Later, an operation might be possible. I'm preserving the eye. Let me show you. Come over here. The cellular structure is being kept alive by these electrical vibrations. I use the same principle in keeping that hand alive. She is a very lucky girl. You think that ironical? Let me explain. I'm the only man alive today capable of restoring your friend's sight. Dr. Alexis Carell, who pioneered the transplanting of vital human organs, kept a portion of an animal's heart alive for many years. For this, he received the Nobel Prize. And I, who have so far surpassed his effort. Surely you don't want to compare yourself with Dr. Carell. He was humane. I, too, fight to preserve life and to find a means to improve the lives of future generations. Your viewpoint is that narrow, ignorant one held by the medical society today, which forces me to work in a place like this, to give in to the whims of a foolish old woman because she can supply me with the funds I need to continue my work. everything on your list while you were talking with the lawyer. Hair appointment, Monday, 10 a.m., Charles of the Ritz, under Nina's name. I'll want Nina to model these later, after I've rested. You tell her.
They're back. I'll have to leave you now. Remember, I'm going to try to get us out of here tonight. No. Forget about me. I won't go. B. Don't talk like that. Mrs. March had not realized her new body had such a satisfactory shape. Perhaps not as spectacular as the English girl, but in excellent taste. She couldn't help being amused. The stupid girl was not only modeling Mrs. March's future wardrobe, but Mrs. March's future body. So firm, so nicely rounded in places men like. You might have knocked when you came in, Victor. I'm sorry. Don't stop your style show on my account. Does my uh, aged lock in Var disturb you? Patty, that's unkind. Shut up. You see, it's hard for a vain, stupid man to realize that he holds no attraction for a lovely young girl. You're not needed now, Victor. Close the door quietly when you go out. I'm not going to be needed at all. That's what you're saying, isn't it? After tomorrow, when... Victor! That's enough! Get out! That's the way it's going to be when what? Don't ask tiresome questions. From the depths of hell comes the Devil's Messenger, starring the master of mystery, Lon Chaney, and Karen Cannon. If you give my message, you'd have to go back. Up there. No, I can't. I won't go back. You'll deliver that to a Mr. Donald Powell. Don't be afraid of me. The Devil's Messenger delivers gifts from hell, turning man into a ravaging beast. I took a picture of that old farmhouse. There's nobody in the picture. You saw it. Was there anybody in it? No, there wasn't. Somebody has come out of that house, and they're coming toward me. Back from the dead, his lovely victim seeks revenge for her horrible death at the hands of a man-driven man by a gift from hell, trapped in her icy tomb until the devil's messenger exposed her nakedness in her crystal prison. Now let's get down to here. She becomes the object of a scientist's lust. His consuming desire for her drives him to commit murder, to keep her for himself. Not since Eve received the apple have gifts inflicted such unnatural consequences. Tonight at midnight, you will be dead. Just how do you intend to kill me? I have no idea. I don't even know you. Crystal ball foreshadows doom. For it is the plaything of the devil. And only he can change the events it foresees. <laughs> you must see what the devil's messenger has in store for you. As you know, my lords and ladies, I've hosted a lot of weird films on the Nerve Rack and Theater. The Brain That Wouldn't Die, Daughter of Horror, Spider Baby. But I have to say, tonight's movie ranks right up there on the what in the name of Vincent Price is going on here scale. Cat women, dog men, undefinable accents. I wonder how it's going to end. You're not looking for me, are you? Why would a pretty young girl want to be around an old man? What did you try to tell Mrs. March? Hmm? So that's what you plan to do. Get rid of old Victor once you get all that money. The only thing is, of course, it won't really be you. Victor, please tell me. 
try to make sense. I am telling you. Tomorrow you'll be one of the richest women in the world. There's a press release. It's in the mails now. To all the major news syndicates. Orphan girl sole heir to March Millions. Nine of Rhodes has a lucky star. I don't understand. The next press release will be March Mansion destroyed by fire. Cinderella girl, Nina Rhodes, sole survivor. Only it won't be you. It's a pity, too. You're nice the way you are. Please don't let it happen. You could help me and B get away. When you're a rich woman, you wouldn't forget an old friend. A friend who'd saved your life, would you? Get out of the car. And stay there. Victor, we too. We must come too. Wait a minute. Just to make sure. No, I won't go. Why should I want to go on living like this? I'll get Victor to help me, and we will carry you. Did you want something from Victor, dear? Sit down, my dear. I'm afraid you're wearing yourself out with all this rushing round. I don't like that. You realize she's mad, don't you, Dr. Frank? <gasps> Relax. Hurry, doctor. I'll be ready for you shortly, Mrs. March. I'll be waiting. about to happen. You don't know what it's been like for me living with this ugly body of mine. Knowing that any attention I received was not for me, but my money. Well, nobody got any of it. I've never known what it was like to be loved for myself alone. Why did you kill Victor, Mrs. March? Victor? <laughs> Victor was a fool. I'm a practical woman, Dr. Frank. A business woman. I've never been a very practical person. I suppose that makes me a fool, too, in your eyes. Of course not. Relax, Mrs. March. Just relax. Relax.
signed a paper making Vicky a legal guardian. That's right, isn't it? I did something, didn't I? That would probably work as well for me. We could stay here. None of this would have to be destroyed. You're eating better, aren't you? Why don't you try it on your own? I want to know if Mrs. March didn't intend blowing me up along with all the rest of this. You're a very wealthy woman now, Nina. What I must decide is how to keep you and your friends available with the least amount of nuisance to myself. I could keep you under sedation until your signature was required. Or I could replace your brain with one more amenable. What about Mrs. March, Doctor? Mrs. March no longer has a thing to say. Do you, my dear? Completely recovered, I'd say. How do you feel? <clears throat> I guess a transplant would be better. It won't hurt. Dr. Frank had enjoyed this transplantation. Mrs. March's brain winding up in the body of a cat. Poetic justice to think of autocratic Mrs. March scavenging in back alley garbage cans for her dinner. But Mrs. March doesn't take things lying down. did not intend to let her money get out of sight. She would follow that girl. Sometime, someplace, revenge would come.
You know, there never was an Atomic Brain 2, but I would have loved to have seen a sequel to this film. That black cat stalking Nina throughout her life, while at the same time trying to find a mad scientist to do a brain transplant. Just watching the cat try to get that message across to the mad scientist would be fun. Well, my lords and ladies, after this, we'll have a classic episode from a classic TV series. Do you love horror, science fiction, B-movies, horror hosts, old-time radio, just plain spooky stuff? Then you should sign up at patreon.com slash lordbloodraw. You'll be supporting the production of Lord Blood Draw's Nerve Rack and Theater, presenting the best, worst, and wildest horror films ever made. Lord Blood Draw's Nerve Rack and Auditorium, featuring the best of old-time radio horror. Captain Paxar's Star Cadet Hour, showing classic 1950s sci-fi shows for Star Cadets of all ages. Plus, you'll get exclusive access to bonus content, like Behind the Curtains of the Nerve Rack and Auditorium, a deep dive into radio horror. Lord Blood Draw's B-Movie Reviews, a look at a classic low-budget drive-in feature, and much more. Sign up today at patreon.com slash lordbloodraw for the love of horror. From ancient genesis to the modern screen, is the name written in blood, Ega! If I could just call you on the phone. The code of the ghost, that's the sign of the toad. Nobody lives on the Brownsville Road. Thrill to the newest recording star, Arturo Jr. Oh, the scream in this way. See ravishing Marilyn Manning in a thrilling, chilling story. The last of the prehistoric giants sees his first girl. Noah. And Curious newsmen search deep in giant country for the last of the ancient cavemen. See a tough giant, tamed by the soft hands of his captive woman. See him sacrifice his ageless beard for her love. Then lose her to a boy in a dune buggy, escaping a burning desert. Igar's primitive passion was love or kill. Here, Ega talk, the ancient language of love, used at the beginning of time. You know, now that I think about it, something's bugging me about that movie. Now, a cat's brain is pretty small, and the size of a human skull is, well, you know, it's this size. How did they keep the cat's brain from rattling around inside her head? Maybe they used packing peanuts or something? Um, while I think this through, you go ahead and watch this episode of One Step Beyond called The Devil's Laughter. Maybe bubble wrap? It begins here, in Wandsworth Prison near London. The year, 1895. Our principal player is one John Marriott. Today is a big day in his life. He's to be hanged. Come on now then, Johnny lad. No need for you to look at that, you know. 
Here. Have a smoke. Come on, Johnny boy. You'll go. When do they come for me? Uh, six. What time is it now? Well, I don't know, 5.30. <gasps> Does it take long? What? Oh, <laughs> nah. How long? How long? Well, I don't know. A couple of minutes, maybe. <laughs> now, come on, Johnny, my boy. There's no need for you to be afraid. Who's afraid? <laughs> well, a bloke as popular with the ladies as what you was. What do you mean, was? I judge it. I am the executioner, sir. At your service. This is my assistant. It's not time yet. You're quite correct, sir. You have exactly 21 minutes. <coughs> Will you please step on this scale now? What do you need my wife for? Eleven stone, sir. Eleven stone? Seventy-one inches. Seventy-one inches? John Marriott. Johnny boy. Don't want it. It's your very last breakfast. Take that slop away. I don't want it. Can't look at it. I don't Are you all right, my son? Is there anything I can do for you? Anything you wish? Any final confession you want to make? She just sat there, with her head thrown back laughing at me like I was some kind of worm or something. I didn't mean to kill her, I swear I didn't, but the way she laughed when I caught her with that dandy filuka, all I could see was her throat. I just grabbed it. I grabbed it. And all the time she kept laughing. Her mouth, her voice, I can hear it now. Screaming, my hands scratching at me. Well, maybe she wasn't laughing. Maybe she was only screaming. Sure, there was Phil Hooker, she screamed, and there was Paddy O'Neill, and everybody in London knows all about that. Ooh, ooh, it, it was like a bomb exploding in my ear. I fell went out of my mind. The Lord is merciful to all his poor sinners. 
Oh, no, I know I'm a sinner. Oh, I know the things I've done. Really, if I ever really started to confess. You know what I've done once? I never told nobody this. I pushed a blind beggar into the gutter and I rubbed his tin cup. There was eight pennies and four shillings and half a crown. I meant to pay him back every cent, but I never did. I went to Epsom, see? And I laid a wager on a nag named Alma's Eyes. <laughs> that nag is still running. There was this sweet old lady there, see, and she'd never seen a race before. So I swapped my ticket with hers, and hers was a winner. Paid 15 to 1. That week, I crawled through every pub from here to Whitehall. That was the week I met Alma. I know, I never should have touched that blind man. I never should have touched Alma. The things I do because a lady has a pretty pair of eyes. But I can't help myself. Please, please don't let him hang me. You must be brave, my son. Please. John Marriott, send your pray. Pray. I can't. Try I that. can't. I can't. I can't! The Lord is my shepherd. I don't want to die! No! I don't want to die! No! Assume the position and open your minds wide. It's time for your cranial cavity search. Ah, uh, yes, my lords and ladies, the cranial cavity search. 
Here's a chance for you great geeks out there to prove your geek cred uh, by showing what you know. <laughs> <laughs> and tonight's cranial cavity search question is... Ed Wood's immortal classic, Plan 9 from Outer Space, began production under a different title. What was the original title of Plan 9 from Outer Space? A. Deadly Plan from Outer Space. B. The Day the Dead Walked. C. Grave Robbers from Outer Space, or D, The Space Corpses. <laughs> what was the original title of Plan 9 from Outer Space? I assure you, these commercials will not help you figure it out. Bold Time Radio Horror Experience the subtle magic of old-time radio horror every week with Lord Blood Draw's Nerve Rack and Auditorium. Chilling audio nightmares from radio classics like Lights Out, The Witch's Tale, Dark Fantasy, and many more. Available on YouTube and most podcast providers. Lord Blood Draw's Nerve Rack and Auditorium. Please leave your eyes at the door. You will not need them. Hey, geeks. Want more Lord Blood Draw? To help support the show and get exclusive content found nowhere else, sign up at patreon.com slash lordblooddraw. And the answer to tonight's cranial cavity search question. What was the original title of Plan 9 from Outer Space? It was... C. Grave Robbers from Outer Space. <laughs> Believe it or not, Plan 9 from Outer Space was financed largely by a Baptist church in Los Angeles. And the ministers there objected to the use of the words grave robbers in the title. So they changed it to Plan 9. <laughs> but now, on to the conclusion of the One Step Beyond episode, The Devil's Laughter, where it seems our convict has narrowly escaped his own execution. What could have happened, sir? Really, I don't. I've been the executioner for 19 years and it's never happened before, sir. We examine that rope very thoroughly, as we always do. Well, how is he, Doctor? Oh, he's coming around. It was merely shock. There's no physical damage at all. Are you quite certain? Quite. Then let's get on with the execution. Let's get fusion. You wasting your time, Governor? <sighs> if you think that I'm going to die on your blyonsted gallows, you've got another thing coming, because I'm not. Marriott, I'm sorry about the accident, but the court has sentenced you to be hanged. But that's the point, Governor. It wasn't no accident. Let's get on with it. Ain't nobody here can kill me. Not if you tried for a hundred years and a hundred ways. Not you. Not you. Not the executioner. Not nobody. I said let's get on with it. Hold on, hold on. I haven't had any breakfast. But what you gonna do, hang me without giving me any grub? I thought you said you didn't want any. Oh, now I do. <laughs> Some healthy for a man to miss his breakfast. All right, but hurry. Oh, good. I haven't had a meal like this since the trial. Mm. You blokes don't hardly give a man time to stow his grub, do you? Would you stand, please? 
I don't mind. Hey! Hey, you blokes are just wasting your time. If you want to know why, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you forget to have a nice lunch waiting for me. I want some roly-poly pie. Hey, where's my brandy? I want my brandy. What kind of a hanging is this? Well, follow me all the days of my life. Tonight. Save your breath, Vicar. They're not hanging me. <laughs> you waste time, Matthew. Let it off. <laughs> oh, now, here we go. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. That's my luckiness. Oh, no, I don't want that. You sure you don't want the wood? Might make it easier for you. I don't need it any easier, mate. All right. This time, just to make sure, we'll try it once more. Ready? Wasting your time, boys. You sure you don't want the hood? No, I don't want the hood. unable to hang you, Mr. Marriott. Ooh, maybe there's a good angel watching over me. More than likely it's the devil, I'd say. Oh, I don't much mind who's watching over me, angel or devil. Just so long as it's somebody with influence. As a matter of fact, quite a lot of people with influence are interested in you, Mr. Marriott. Oh. Your case has been debated right now in the House of Commons. Mr. Gladstone thinks that you should be set free, that you've suffered enough. <laughs> well, now, that makes two of us. <laughs> uh, but seriously, Mr. Marriott, don't you have some theory as to why you couldn't be hanged? Do I know why I couldn't be hanged? <laughs> and if one of your iron mighty papers is willing to pay... 500 quid for the information? 500 pounds? <laughs> That's not very likely. <laughs> then I'm not very likely to tell. <laughs> uh. I wager you hate to see me go away, Governor. I hate to see anyone make justice look foolish. Oh, come now, Governor, don't take on so. If you was to put me up on that there gallows fifty times, you still couldn't hang me. Now go on home, Marriott. You want another try at me neck, Governor? I'd be glad to oblige. Now get out of here. You're smart not to take me up, Governor, because I'd win sure as I'm standing here. You know how I know? Well, you listen, and I'll tell you. Just when they was, when they was pulling that hood over my head and the rope snapped, I saw how old John Marriott was going to die. And it wasn't on no gallows. I said, get out. <laughs> it's your jail, Dudney. Now go home, will you? I'm going to die in a most amazing way, Dudney. In a most remarkable way. Some more for Marley and too. Don't let them movie lips get dry. Mm. <laughs> you know, when they take you to the gallows, they offer you a glass of brandy. Now, ain't that sweet of them? Oh, I bet you had the old bottle, eh, Johnny? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen their faces when them gallows wouldn't work. That blue and execution, he kept kicking, kicking that release boat till I thought he'd have a stroke. Ooh. You with that noose around your neck? Aren't you scared? Scared what for? They couldn't hang me. Not if they tried. Till doomsday. Oh, come off it, Johnny. How could you know? Devil himself whispered in my ear. Johnny! Oh, Liz! Johnny. Where have Johnny. 
jump in, oh, you blue men, like a rose. You know, oh, blush, did you miss me while I was Johnny, in the jungle? Johnny, Johnny, Will, he's coming, he's coming. God, he'll... give us a kiss. Oh. Johnny, he's got a gun. Come on, have an ale. Two ales, Georgie, one for Liz and one for Will when he gets here. Ain't you afraid he'll kill you? Will, no. Will's a mouse, not a lion. You want to know how I'm going to die? I tell you, there's only one way I can die. One way and no other. Around. And around and I'll tell you about my vision. Though the press offer me 500 quid, I won't charge you a farthing. John, John. Old Johnny Marriott's going to die at the foot of a lion right here on the streets of London. That's how it's going to be, I know. I was standing there on them gallows. I was standing there with that white hood over my head. And I heard him release the lever, and I heard them trap doors swinging open, and I felt myself falling. And while I was falling, the inside of that hood lit up like a million candles. And there I was, lying dead at the feet of a lion, right here on the streets of London. And I knew. I knew that's how it had to be. That way, and no other! Turn around, John. Not the rail, Georgie. If you think you can kill my sister and go scot-free, you've got another thing coming. <whistles> Too much head on that ale, Georgie. Turn around, John, or I'll shoot you right in the back. <whistles> That's better, Georgie. Huh? Hey. Hey, you know, you know Alma Cooper? That girl what I strangled. Well. I hear her brother's looking for revenge. Now you tell him, will you? You tell him that if Alma were alive, I'd kill her again right now. Again right. She deserved everything she got. And you deserve what you're gonna get, John Marriott. Try it again, Will. Mm. You couldn't hurt me. You couldn't hurt me with a cannibal. Now, with a whole regiment of gladiators to back you up, you couldn't hurt me unless you could bring the jungles of Africa up here to London. Well, that's come wake you up. Now lift up that pistol and I'll shoot. Find them 
all over London. The symbol of Britain, you know. My lords and ladies, while pondering the question of how you keep a cat's brain from rattling around inside a human skull, I have stumbled upon an even larger question. How do you fit a human brain inside a cat's skull? Medical science will be pondering that question for centuries. Well, my lords and ladies, I want to thank you all for watching, and I want to invite you all back again next week when we'll do whatever this is all over again. Ha <laughs> ha! As always, I am Lord Bloodraw saying, uh, geek out.